probably about 10 years ago, 10 years ago, that uh, we had a very memorable Christmas uh, at our house, our family. We, we did the normal Christmas thing. You know, you wake up and, you, and, and the kids were, all, of course, all younger and everything. We did Christmas and, and we probably had, you know, a nice meal and, and uh, who knows. Uh, anyway, all I remember, the part I remember is that evening uh, when all the festivities were done and we're kind of laying around and we're like starving to death. Do you ever get there? You know, you're like, I, I mean, like in our context, right? But <laughs> Uh, well, we're just, we're just hungry, and no one wants to fix anything. It's like, it's Christmas, we've done everything. Like, oh, come on, you know, I don't do anything. So we decide we're going to have this great family adventure. And as we jump in the car, we're going to find someone, some place that's open on a Sunday, on, on, excuse me, on a, on a Christmas, on a Christmas day. And, and uh, there's a few places these days that are, but, but it, was, it was more rare back then. And we're driving all over the place. We finally found up, found, uh, ended up in, in Ankeny. I won't say the name of the place because it doesn't matter, but it was a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> And, and we go in there, and, and it was just it was so comical, because all we could think about was a Christmas story. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Now, some of you haven't seen it. It's, it's hard to believe this. I've heard people who haven't seen it. So in case you don't know, i got a two-minute clip. This is the scene. <laughs> so we go to this Chinese buffet, and, and uh, it was terrible. It was just awful. Uh, I mean, only because, were, I mean, generally they're good. But, but there was nobody there. I mean, there was one other family. And the food probably had been sitting out for hours. And, I mean, it was one of those days, it was so bad that we were actually laughing. It was just like, this is hilarious that we even did this. And uh, we vowed to never go back to a Chinese restaurant on Christmas uh, again. Anyway, so it became a great, great family memory. Ten years later, we still talk about it when we drive by the, the place because it was just, just kind of fun. Um, and and uh, to, to their defense, if, if I was going to try to do a Chinese culture celebration, I would slaughter it much worse than they did. But, uh, I mean, that's just, you know, <laughs> that's just cross-cultural things here. The, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Christmas and, and things like scaling back, maybe a little bit simplifying giving yourself permission to say no to things and it's been kind of fun talking to people say hey I said no to whatever it's like yeah stuff like 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 that uh, creating a balance in, in our Christmas uh, celebrations today I'm going to look we want to look a little bit on the flip side so to speak of the coin because God isn't just a fuddy-duddy right he's not just saying no don't do anything don't ever eat don't ever you know, I mean there, there is celebration with God right I mean, right? So, so uh, you know, to, to, to balance this out as, as well, we want to talk a little bit about the celebration side, side of Christmas. Now, when the Israelites were uh, just about ready to take possession of the promised land, they'd come out of slavery. This is like the first time they're really a nation, right? They'd come out of slavery from Egypt. They've been wandering around for 40 years in the desert, and they're finally getting ready to go into the promised land, this place where God said it's flowing with milk and honey. You're going to be able to have land. You'll be able to have a home. You'll plant roots. Your families will flourish. It'll be this great place. And as they're preparing to go there, God tells them, okay, I want, you're going to go in there. You're going to take the land. Now, knock down, uh, clean out the old worship areas that were uh, set up to worship other gods. Because we're going to worship me here. It's, it, I'm, I'm the living God. So we're, we're going to worship me there. And, and as you do that, uh, to, 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 to clean those places out, uh, to, to do some sacrifices to him to kind of like purify the thing and, 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 and you know, bless it type of thing. And then basically he says, I want you to throw a party. All right, because because guess what? This is cool. God, I'm doing a big thing in your life. And he says in Deuteronomy 12, And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. You shall rejoice. You and your households, the families get together and, and have throw a party, right? And all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You've gone from slavery to freedom. You've gone from wandering around in a desert to a fertile land uh, with, with great crops. Just a great place to live. You're going to find a home. You're going to raise your families. It's, it, your life is about to change. I want you to throw a party. It was a big deal. Rejoice, he says. Celebrate what God has done. Now, this isn't just a one-time time event where, where, where God says, I want you to celebrate. I mean, there, there, there was a pattern God set up in the Old Testament uh, to, to remind Israel over and over again of the things he was doing in their life, of the blessings he was giving to their life annual feasts that they were to take place, or take part in as families, as, as a community, as, as the nation, and, and it was all very symbolic. There was a lot of imagery involved in these feasts to remind them of specific things. So it wasn't just eating for the sake of eating. It wasn't just gluttony. It wasn't just rolling around. So, so put that through the proper 
filter when we read these verses is not saying just go crazy for the sake of, hey, we have an excuse to go crazy. It was specifically to remind them of things that God had done in their life. In Leviticus 23, there's a list of seven different annual feasts that, that God wanted the people to celebrate every year. Now, now some of them uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be a feast as you might think of it, like all the food you can eat buffet thing, but some of them were. Uh, all of them involved a Sabbath, which was a day of rest. So they had their typical Sabbath day, Saturday. But you had these feasts that often began with a rest and ended with a rest, in addition to the, the other day of rest. So it was a break in the cycle of work that they normally did. Just like most of you probably have some time off for Christmas. You might, what is it, on a Tuesday this year, you'll have your weekend off if you have a Monday through Friday job. And they probably gave you a Monday and Tuesday as well. It was this time set aside to celebrate specifically things that God had done. So here, here's these feasts. There's the Passover feast. You probably heard that the most uh, because it's you know, heading up to Easter and it was big time with, with, with the, the story of Jesus and, and Easter. But this was a yearly feast. It included seven days of eating special foods uh, that were, had a very specific symbolic meaning, each one of them. It concluded with a special Sabbath and a special meal that uh, reminded them there were bitter herbs and there were things that didn't necessarily taste good and the point was to remind them of the bitterness of slavery the slavery was awful nobody wants to be in a slave in egypt you weren't born under this you know after years of course they could look back i wasn't born in slavery but my ancestors were and i want to be reminded of how awful it would have been to be a slave in egypt so they would eat this meal with bitter herbs and, and different ingredients uh, to remind them about that and also it would remind them the cost of freedom freedom. Uh, the, the last plague was a, the, the killing of a lamb, and they put the blood on the doorpost, and, and the firstborn of every child in Egypt uh, who didn't have blood on the doorpost died. So there was great suffering that took place. They would eat a lamb. This is for years and years and years later. They kept doing this uh, to remind them of the price, the high price of being freed from slavery. And each family would gather in their own home every year for the special meal, the, the climax of, of the Passover feast, and the youngest child every year would ask the question, something, something along the line of, what, why are we doing this? You know, asking, what, what, what's, go, what's going on? And every year, the oldest male would answer and retell the story about Moses and about the plagues and the Pharaoh and how God brought them to freedom and, 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 and so forth. And so it was a yearly, every single year as a family, they gathered for the purpose of remembering uh, this, this amazing story in, in Jewish history. Uh, the same story, the same food, the same menu, the same question, the same conversation, year after year uh, after year. It, it was just God built that into the system. Another one of the feasts is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And uh, it was a reminder. When, when, when Pharaoh decided to let him go, uh, it wasn't like, hey, take a few weeks to go. It was like, get out of here. And, and so there was with great haste that Israel took up their lives out of Egypt and fled to the desert. They didn't have time. Well, wait a minute. We've got to bake some bread first. Let the yeast rise, you know, yada, yada. It was like, get out of there now. So there's no yeast in the bread. And, and it was the Feast of Unleavened Breads was a reminder of how quickly they had to get out of town and, and, and go on. So during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, the family would not use yeast in their bread for an entire week. For seven days, every day, every time they ate bread, it was a reminder. Why, why, why don't we, why don't we have the good bread? Well, because, and they would retell the story of what happened again. They just kept retelling the story all year long, year after year after year after year. They wanted to, God wanted to instill in the adults and the children, year after year, the reminder of, of how awful slavery was in Egypt and how he freed them from that. And so families would take time from these, in these feasts to, to, to do that. There was a feast of first fruits. This was the yearly feast at the beginning of the harvest. So, hey, it's time to harvest and he would wave it before the Lord, and it was kind of a celebration of, look, God, you have provided. Uh, look what you've done. Uh, we're ready to go in the harvest. Bless the harvest. Uh, you've blessed the crop. And it was, again, a reminder, not, not just how, how hard they had worked, but what God had provided. But he had, you have brought us to a promised land. You've given us 
fertile ground as opposed to the desert we roamed around when you couldn't plant this out there. But you can hear, so it was a continual reminder of the provision that, that God uh, was giving to the people. So the family would go home after, after that event, and, and they would have this meal and celebrate how God had uh, blessed them. That, that's really kind of the idea be, behind our Christmas feast we have every year. Last Sunday night, we had a big feast here, and it's not just to have food. It really is intended to be, look, God, God has blessed us. Well, isn't, isn't God awesome? God is so wonderful. It, it's, it's, it's a food with, with, with a purpose. The, the Feast of Weeks, this occurred 50 days after the first fruits a feast. All right, so you had the beginning of harvest, and now this is the end of harvest. They didn't have a big John Deere tractor or whatever to do it all in two days, you know, so it took some time and effort and labor to, to do the harvest. So, so the 50 days later, the first, first fruits feast took place, uh, celebrating the end of harvest, and, and they took the day off again. There was a Sabbath. They feasted. They celebrated God. They thanked him for the completed harvest. Again, it was a reminder for every single family that, that, that yes, they may have done the work, but God brought the, the rain. God brought the, the growth. He, he brought the increase. He provided the bounty for the family and for the nation, and it was a celebration of God. There's the Feast of Trumpets. This was meant to uh, signal the Israel, that they were coming into a sacred season. So these trumpets would blow, and people would kind of pause, and it was a time to, to uh, it was again, another Sabbath, another day off. They, 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 they would contemplate the sins of their life. What have I done this year? Uh, what, have I offended God? Have I offended my neighbor and my family? Have I, what have I, what have I, how have I lived my life this year? So there'd be some self-evaluation uh, going on, and, and they would, the, the day of reckoning was coming soon. Uh, Ten days later is the Day of Atonement, another feast. This is after the, the trumpets blow. You have ten days to kind of contemplate. And, and this is when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the tab tabernacle or in the sanctuary, either the tent of meeting or the, the temple later on. Uh, that happened in both throughout the, the centuries. Uh, the high priest would go in there. Uh, he would make an offering for the sins of Israel. There would be two goats. One would be... Uh, slain for the sins of the people, and the blood would be applied, and, and, and the, there would be another goat that, that uh, the priest would lay his hands on, and he, he would pray over that goat. And basically, he is, he is transferring the sins of all the people to him and on to the goat, right? And, and so that this goat is taking the sins of Israel, and they would send the goat off into the wilderness being a scapegoat is where we get that term, and that was where this was, what this was all about. When this took place, a, a big celebration took, took place. I mean, it was, it was a party. It was like, I am free. The sins have been taken from me and taken away. God has given me a fresh start. I have a new beginning, and it was a big, big celebration, the Day of, Tom, of Atonement. All these things, all these feasts, they're, they're very visual. They're very symbolic, right? It's not just a big meal, you know, with cranberry sauce, it's, it's, which, you know, whatever, but it could have had it, but uh, it, it is very meaningful and purposeful so that it left an image you wouldn't forget. You don't forget the priest putting his hands on a, on a goat on the head and praying and seeing that goat go off and that visual of my sins are leaving. You, know, you don't forget that kind of thing. You don't forget the bitter herbs that you ate. You don't forget the unleavened bread uh, that, that you ate. That there's, all these things were very purposeful in, in the Old Testament. There was a feast of booths. This took place five days after the Day of Atonement. So there were some that were squished together and then there were periods of time in the yearly cal calendar where it was just normal life. So, so they kind of were spread out. But this is another five days after the Day of Atonement. Uh, for seven days, Israelites brought offerings to God. Uh, they lived in small uh, tents, so to speak, like, like, like uh, little huts they made out of palm branches. It reminded them for seven days. So family camp out. Hey, kids, pack up. We're going out to the, to the tent, right? And it was to remind them for seven days that God brought provision and shelter when they were wandering in the desert. None of these kids experienced the desert, but every year they experienced the Feast of Booths to remind them how God had brought provision to the family all those hundreds of years ago, uh, depending on you know, when, when time of the frame we're talking about. So this happened year after year after year. So, so God obviously isn't against celebrating. All right, so I, I hope you don't get the, the, the wrong idea. I was saying, you know, I was an old fuddy that he's saying, stop your celebrating, you know, um, uh, but rather to kind of maybe, maybe scale back a, a, a little bit um, uh, to, to, to celebrate the right things. 
Right? Um, that's what we're talking about. Uh, to celebrate with purpose. His celebrations had meaning to it and, and depth to it. Uh, another one, um, you all have heard of the tithe, right? Churches talk about the tithe, you give your 10% to God and everything. And the Old Testament talked about the first 10% went, went to God. There was a second 10% that went to the family. But the family, it was almost like your, your own personal savings account. For, for throughout the year, you would set aside 10% and, and blow it on, on a big feast. It's in Deuteronomy 14. Uh, just read through this for the fun of it. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes in from the field year by year. So for us, it'd be your paycheck, right? Uh, and before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name uh, dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and of the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way, so, so now he's going to say, if, if, if you're going to travel to, to do this offering and this party, uh, if you're going to go down to Jerusalem to do this, and you live way far away, and it's, you have all these goats and all this, it's just going to be too much work to carry. He's going to say, just sell it and go down there and use that same money and rebuy it and then throw your party. That's what this is. If, if the way is too long for you that you're not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you uh, because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money, bind up the money in your hand, go to the place the Lord your God chooses, uh, spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God. Rejoice that you and your household... Um, and you shall uh, not neglect the Levite. Oh, oh, it says bring the preacher along. So just put that, in. Just, just saying, you know, you go on vacation this year, uh, don't forget. Uh, do not neglect the Levite who is within you, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. Now, now think, think about that for a minute. If you put 10% of your check away every day and every week, whenever you get paid, every month, uh, and put in a special account, and once a year you said we're throwing a party. Get the family together, we're just going to celebrate God. That's kind of crazy right? I, I mean, I've only known one family who really does this uh, that I know of. We might come close to it. We just call it vacation, you know, and that's, vacations are good and good's all part of the pattern of Sabbath and everything, but uh, uh, here, here's, here's the thought. If, if you treat your vacation as a time to run away from reality and, and, and everything, uh, I, I would switch that in your mind to, I'm using vacation to go and celebrate God. You can celebrate God on vacation, can't you? Say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's not like, hey, free Sunday off. No one knows I didn't go to church. Now, hopefully you find a church. I always find a church when I'm out on vacation. Uh, but, 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 you know, we, we go to uh, Zimbabwe every year. And, and in my maybe twisted, I mean, because we're not, we're not bound to this, right? Um, it's Old Testament stuff. But uh, in my way, I've kind of looked at that as uh, my uh, second tithe type thing. Because, you know, it costs a chunk of change to go out there. But I figured that is my way of I'm, I'm leaving and, and we're, we're celebrating, we're rejoicing, we're having a lot of great time with some fellow believers. They just happen to be in Zimbabwe, and we're doing some teaching there and celebrating God, and, and, and uh, it, it's just really cool. So I kind of look at this partly like that second tithe uh, in, in, in celebrating what, what uh, uh, God's done in my life and is doing in, in their lives. So, so I'm just saying, re-look at your vacation. There's never an escape from God. You never, never take time off for, for, from God. It, it's just a shift in how you're doing it. Um, in this case, they said, hey, throw this big party and celebrate God. God has blessed you. Uh, be happy about it. You all happy God's blessed you? Yes. I mean, right? I mean, you know, we're not supposed to be a bunch of fuddy-duddy Christians and growling all the time. It's like, celebrate, celebrate. Uh, now, now, I also, I'd say, put this through the filter uh, of, of don't, like, go crazy celebrate to the point you're, like, stumbling around. And, and you know, I mean, that, I'm, I'm assuming that when I say this. It's not like rolling around in gluttony and, like, I need 17 donuts. <laughs> it's the feast of God. No, I mean, you know, uh, just be careful. You, you, you use your judgment, but, but celebrate in a, in a way that's honoring to God. So we, we obviously don't have these feasts anymore. We don't celebrate them. I, I mean, there's some people who kind of toy with them and stuff. But uh, we, we do have uh, Christian holidays that, that we celebrate. This kind of replaced some of these. They're actually, um, dare I say, more meaningful even. Every Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that not the biggest story ever? I mean, the story of Moses and, and, and the slaves and, and, and the plagues, that's cool and that's powerful and that's amazing. But... but this side of the cross, we can look at it and say, yeah, but Jesus like rose from the dead, took my sin. That's big. 
Okay, that's what we're, so we celebrate that, and we make a big deal out of that. And there's churches that do cantatas and special programs and week-long different things. You know, so it's, it's a big deal leading up to that. Uh, a lot of people do what, the Lent thing, where there's like 40 days of prep. It's basically a 40-day fast. They don't know it. Um, that where they're, they're leading up. To, so it's a spiritual thing that they're engaged in. They're preparing themselves for that. And Christmas is the same thing. It's the birth of the Savior. So some churches you know they have a, an Advent calendar, and some people do that. Um, and, and, and we do, you know, there's cantatas and programs and meals and special events and and it's all about saying hey this is special this it, it's 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 a it's a uh, taking us out of our normal schedule, our normal day to day, our normal. Even, even what's cool about it is even the secular world does it. They just secularize it because you know they can't talk about Jesus too much, right? But but, but we know why they're doing it. it. It's because we're celebrating the birth of the Savior of the world. How cool is that? So definitely celebrate. Uh, Christmas, uh, <laughs> I would say maybe uh, that um, although we need to scale back, how do I want to say this, the secular part of it, possibly, uh, we're probably guilty of not celebrating enough the actual biblical story of Christmas. I don't think you can over-celebrate that. I don't think you can over-tell the story. I tell you about there was a, there was a time, uh, probably in my 20s, maybe even 30s, when I was like, okay, we get Christmas, right? I was, I, I, as a preacher, this is just terrible, a confession, uh, I was like, I'm kind of tired of the story. Can we talk about anything but this? I, I'm not that I didn't appreciate the story, but it's like, we all get it. We all get it. And, and as I've gotten older, and I, I look back and I look at, at, at like the whole pattern of the Old Testament, it's like, there was ne you, God never said, only do Passover until you get bored of the story, and then take a few years. No, he's, every year I want you to do this. You know? uh, he doesn't tell us to do Christmas, but, but the principle's pretty much there. It's like, I hope the story is familiar. I, mean, I hope... That, that you do know it, but I hope you don't get bored with the... Uh, didn't we just read that scripture? I mean, there's only a few scriptures that talk about the, the birth of Christ and Christmas. So it's like, yeah, we're going to hit those a lot during the Christmas season. But, but it's so critical, we never forget. We never forget these, these verses. Our children need to know every opportunity, what we're doing and why. Because they, you don't get tired of the Santa Claus commercials, do you? Or you might, but I mean... Uh, <laughs> You, they don't get tired of seeing Santa at every mall and every corner and every, you know, every, uh, you know it's like, uh, well, let's not be tired of telling them the story of Christmas. Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 8, in that same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were filled with fear. The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Man, that's a powerful word. A Savior who is Christ. He is Messiah, right? Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. There's a scene of celebration. I don't think the angel's like, oh, good, the Son of God is born. Isn't that sweet? I mean, when I think of angelic beings like celebrating, I just think, Whoa! I mean, you know, I mean, like there is something going on there. Um, enough that the shepherds were like frightened at what was happening. You know, like this is, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this before. There's a celebration that went on. Uh, great news of great joy, good news of great joy for all the people. A Savior has been born today who is Christ the Lord. He is your Savior. Never tire of telling our kids and our grandkids and our friends and our neighbors and coworkers or whoever who will listen the story. This is why we do this. This is why we do this. It's bigger than the harvest. Uh, it, it is bigger than the story of, of, uh, it, uh, of Jewish slaves coming out of Egypt. It's bigger than, than last year's harvest or, or, or however you calculate you know, your, your harvest. You know, at the end of the year, it's about tax time. You're going to have a harvest of some sort you're going to account for. It's bigger than that, although those are great and God has blessed you and he has been good to you. But, but, but man, this story is beyond that. It's eternal. We have something to celebrate. A Savior has been born. Emmanuel, God is with us. He came to this world, took our punishment for sin, died in our place, rose from the dead. That's why we celebrate Easter so much. 
to the point you can honestly say, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you can honestly say, the best day of my life will be when I breathe my last and I open my eyes and there's Jesus. That's only possible because of Christmas you know, and Easter, right? Because he was born and he died and rose from the dead. That is we're celebrating. Guys, we'll be celebrating that for eternity. I mean, for eternity. We might as well celebrate a little bit, too. So, let me encourage you to have a little fun. After I've told you two weeks to scale back and take it easy and, and you, know, you know, the whole thing, uh, let me encourage you to have some fun. Don't apologize for engaging in the festivities of the season. You don't need to feel guilty if you enjoy the shopping or the eating or the singing or the lights and all that stuff. However, do it properly. If I use that word, do, do it in a spiritual way where you're acknowledging God through the whole time. Uh, you're getting out of the normal flow of your life. Uh, you're spending time in a concerted effort to celebrate Christ. You know what? So you're with the kids or grandkids or whoever, and you're baking cookies. Make sure you mention, hey, you know why we're doing this, right? You get together and you're doing the presents. Hey, you know why we're doing this, right? I know a lot of families who will, will actually uh, pause and read the Christmas story before they open gifts. How cool is that? I mean, of course, if you're, you have children, they're, they're all year, they want to open the presents. That's good. It's like, hey, but first, first, let's, let's remember why. Uh, that's just doing the same thing the Jewish people did for centuries and centuries and centuries, back as far as you can remember to the time of Moses coming out. Uh, well, to the, yeah. So I, I would ch encourage you to make that a part of your celebration. Celebrate. Uh, we have our Christmas Eve service, which is, a, uh, I mean, gosh, to me, that's like one of the biggest things you can do is we just a pause in the middle of all the craziness right at the, the climax of everything that's about to happen and just say, hey, let's remember what this is. You know, so that's why we do the Christmas Eve service. Uh, so if you're out of town, go find one. Go to one. Go to one somewhere. Just, just, just pause and say, ah, Jesus, Jesus, the Savior has been born. That's what this is all about.